Howdy, I'm Sydney Rosario. I'm the Poultry Programs Administrator here at the Texas A&M Veterinary Diagnostic Lab. Thank you for asking us to speak. Um, we're really excited to share our knowledge and share um, what we love about poultry. We're all a little bit of a bird nerds here at the lab. Um, so we have two speakers for you all today. Our first is Dr. Martin Ficken. He's our resident director of the Gonzalez Poultry Lab in Gonzalez, Texas. Um, and he's gonna be talking about some common poultry diseases um, and probably have some really cool photos to show you as well. And our second speaker today will be Ms. Mindy Borst. She's the assistant section head for clinical pathology here at the lab. She's gonna be talking about poultry parasites. So basically all the creepy crawlies um, that you might see in a flock. If there are any questions after this presentation, um, you can ask Amanda and she will get with us and we can get you some answers to those questions. And then Dr. Ficken and Mindy also have a slide with their contact information if there's any questions. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over. Thank you. Presentation that uh, I've utilized in a number of applications on identification, prevention and treatment of common diseases in backyard poultry. That's just for the purposes of basically understanding the, the common diseases that you'll see in backyard birds and some uh, recommendations for treatment or diagnoses or what is available to you as a raiser or a veterinarian in this particular situation. As an introduction, uh, I strongly recommend consultation with a veterinarian or other health professional uh, for diagnosing and treating your disease problems. And the diagnostic lab where I work is designed mainly to support the local veterinary practitioners in the various states. However, there is instances where there is no such support or veterinarians in an area do not wish to deal with poultry or backyard birds. And so they people can interact directly with the diagnostic lab. And then one other final introduction thing is there's a useful website with many solutions and supportive treatments for poultry that's been published by the Mississippi State University Extension Office. And it has the uh, link there at the bottom. And it has all kinds of useful things that uh, are related to uh, various conditions that I may not even cover that you might diagnose or suspect having. So I'm going to jump right into the diseases that are the most common and the things that I see most commonly at the diagnostic lab or get phone calls for. First one is mycoplasma galaseptica and mycoplasma synovia, which are the cause of mycoplasmosis. It's an upper respiratory disease. It's caused by a bacterium that doesn't have a cell wall, so it doesn't like to live outside of the bird. So it has to be spread from bird to bird or by fomites before the organism dies after it leaves the body of the bird. But it causes various kinds of conditions, coughing, nasal discharge, conjunctivitis, watery eyes, bubbling coming out of the eyes is a very common description. By itself, it's usually not fatal unless it's in the very young, but it does set up birds for secondary infections such as uh, cholebacillosis. And it is treatable, uh, but for diagnoses, you can go on clinical symptoms and response to treatment, or we do have direct diagnostic tools and indirect diagnostic tools at the diagnostic lab. We do have a polymerase chain reaction, which is abbreviated PCR for the for this particular presentation. For MG and MS, it detects the presence of both organisms, and that's a direct detection. And that's usually done on oral pharyngeal swabs or tracheal swabs. And then we also have serology for antibodies, and usually that's birds that are bled after the disease process has been going on for a while, so they have an opportunity to make antibodies that we can detect. And this is a presumptive or indirect diagnosis. We've had clinical symptoms compatible with the disease. We now have antibodies 
in the bloodstream for that disease, so we make that presumptive diagnosis. Here is uh, one of the common pictures that you'll see. It's got a very reddened conjunctiva of the eye. It's, it's very wet and damp, and this bird may have had bubbly eyes. You can see the crust around the eyes, the, the dried exudate, the, the brownish yellowish material, and then the nares on the left, the nasal openings are also plugged with debris. This is a common presentation in chickens. In turkeys, it can be very much worse in that the sinuses can really blow up and get very filled with a honey-like exudate. This is a very severe case in, in turkeys, and it's a much more serious disease in turkeys, and in and of itself, by itself, can cause more mortality in turkeys in, than in chickens. Fortunately, we have good treatment for this. Uh, there's a tylosin, Thailand soluble gram powder, uh, usually comes in a 100 gram pack. It makes 50 gallons at two grams per gallon that you do for five to seven days. And if you don't need that much, you can just use three quarters to one teaspoon per gallon. This is approved for poultry. There's a very short withdrawal time in chickens and in turkeys. Another one that you might try is lincomycin, spectinomycin in the water, and the dosages are there. And it's that's the basic dosage on the package insert. And again, administer five to seven days and there is no withdrawal time. I usually recommend Thailand as my go-to drug for this particular disease. Uh, another organism that can cause a similar symptoms is called infectious coryza caused by Avibacterium paragallinarum. It is a true bacteria, and it is very similar to mycoplasmosis. Uh, it can cause the coughing, the nasal discharge, the conjunctivitis, but it's more known for causing a very, very severe swelling of the infraorbital sinus under the eye. It, too, is... Uh, not a fatal disease if it's uncomplicated. It does, too, get secondary bacterial infections, but it is a differential rule-out for mycoplasmosis. And just like mycoplasma, infected birds become carriers for life. So with mycoplasma, once they recover, they're probably not going to get sick again from the disease, but they're carriers and they're uh, potential sources of infection for other birds that you would bring in that are naive. Same with this particular disease. Our diagnostic tools at Texas Diagnostic Lab is just a bacterial culture of the sinus material. There are PCR tests available at other diagnostic labs that can be done on various swabs taken from the upper respiratory tract. We do not have those available here at, at the TVMDL. We have been working on trying to get one here. We do not have one currently. Here's a case, a classical case, where the sinus is just filled up. The, the couple of cases that I've seen here at the diagnostic lab, which are much, much less common than the mycoplasma, uh, look just like this. And we were able to demonstrate the presence of the organism. Treatment is the same. I won't go over it again as for mycoplasma. So. If you've got the upper respiratory and it looks like one or the other, it doesn't really matter if you need to just get treatment. The treatment would be the same. Again, just like with mycoplasma, these birds are carriers for life and would place naive birds at risk if you bring in naive birds. The next disease uh, that I'm covering is infectious laryngotracheitis. Uh, this does pop up in backyard flocks on occasion. It is a herpes virus, and it's, it's a viral disease that causes severe upper respiratory disease, or can, uh, coughing, conjunctivitis. You can actually get birds spewing out blood, and it spreads very, very rapidly. 
uh, usually, or it can be a, in older birds, it can be a kind of a chronic smoldering upper respiratory disease with a lot of mucus in the upper respiratory tract. In the state of Texas, this is a reportable disease. So if we diagnose this at the diagnostic lab, uh, the Animal Health Commission gets notified and that flock comes under surveillance of them and they decide what to do with that particular flock. Our diagnostic tools, we have a PCR for infectious laryngotracheitis at the diagnostic lab and it detects the presence of the organism. And then we also like to do, if we have dead birds or birds that are sacrificed, we like to do microscopic examination of the characteristic lesions to confirm the presence of what I look for is intranuclear inclusion bodies in tracheal epithelial cells, which are very characteristic and complement the PCR test. Here's a case of the, on the left is the severe fibrinohemorrhagic or just hemorrhagic tracheitis where there's blood and phlegm in the trachea. And you can see why these birds would cough out blood. And on the right, I don't know if you can see it, but there's that large uh, what we call a syncytial cell, just that big purple mass with all those blue dots in them. There's a lot of inclusion bodies in there, what I'm looking for, which are very characteristic, and that's confirmation. All the red cells above that are just inflammatory cells. As this is a very severe disease, and the uh, epithelium is just gone, and it's just inflamed. There is no treatment because it is a viral disease. So I'm not going to cover the other upper respiratory viruses like infectious bronchitis, endemic Newcastle disease virus, or metanumavirus. They all cause a common upper respiratory disease. They come and they go, and if uncomplicated in the mild forms, they don't cause much problem, and they do not stick around. They just go ahead and, and are eliminated from the body and from the flock, and the birds become immune. But we don't see that very common in backyard flocks, so I haven't really placed that in, in this particular presentation. The uh, number one killer in, uh, in birds is, this, is a, what's usually a secondary infection called Escherichia coli, or we abbreviated E. coli, or cholebacillosis. It's usually the secondary invader in many of these diseases. It would be the secondary invader in mycoplasma. It would be the secondary invader in coryza. It could also be a secondary invader in the uh, infectious laryngotritis, laryngotracheitis, and the other viral diseases. So birds usually just have that sick bird look. They're huddled. They're ruffled feathers, de dehydrated. They don't want to move. They just want to sit there. Or it can be very acute where the birds are just found dead. Lesions consist of what we call a polycerocytis, which means just massive inflammation around all the serous membranes like the air sacs, around the lungs, around the liver, and in the salomic cavities. They'll have big livers, they'll have big spleens. Uh, infections in the hatchery, like any bacterial infection in the hatchery, can lead to very high mortality in the very young, and we call that omphalitis. I've got a picture of that in the next slide. Our diagnostic tools are just bacterial cultures of the lesion. Very easy to grow. Here is uh, cholebacillosis on the left is what I call omphalitis in a baby bird. This, the skin is reflected back, the salomic cavity is filled with all kinds of yellow exudate. And you can see kind of at the bottom of the body cavity, there's a little brown button, which is a, the, uh, where the uh, yolk was internalized and that got infected before it got closed up and the spread the bacterial infection into the body cavity. The one on the right is what I call the polycerocytis. It's the fibrinous exudate. It's on the surface of the liver. The bird's head is to the left and the feet are to the right. And that's the heart encased in a whole bunch of that yellowish white exudate. And then the same stuff is observed over the surface of the liver. And if you pulled out the 
intestinal tract and gizzard, that same inflammatory exudate would be present throughout the salomic cavity. This is something that we treat. The most common thing used in backyard birds is uh, tetracycline. There's various forms of that, uh, usually from 200 to 1,000 milligrams per gallon drinking water for five to seven days. Uh, this is an old drug that's been around forever. It's still widely used. If you can get a hold of it, I've had some people have trouble getting it lately, but there's various uh, manufacturers of this, so it comes under various names. But the bottom line is it's either oxytetracycline, chlortetracycline, or just called tetracycline. Again, a short withdrawal time. Okay, that covers mainly the respiratory diseases and the complications of it. Now I want to go, uh, which is the most common call that I get is about upper respiratory disease, and it's almost always mycoplasmosis. The second most common call or uh, submission that I get is Marich's disease. And if you haven't heard about Marich's disease, it's a virus that causes inflammation and cancer. There's various forms of this. Uh, it's a disease that has been around for a long, long time. It was discovered over 100 years ago by a gentleman named Joseph Merrick, and that's where the disease comes from. But it's a herpes virus infection. It's very contagious. There are three what we call serotypes. There's the serotype one, which is the virulent, which has subcategories of very virulent and very, very virulent. Then there's a serotype two, which is a naturally avirulent form. And then there's a serotype three, which is an avirulent form, but it's, it's from turkeys. It's a turkey herpes virus and we call it HVT for that. And, uh, that, as I'll, as I'll show you in a little bit, is the very first vaccine that was used for this disease. The reason this is so isn't so infectious is that the virus is produced in the feather follicle epithelium and it's shed in the chicken dander. So it's, and you, as you know, that you can't really clean up chicken dander in the environment. So once this virus is shed in the chicken dander, it's, it's fairly resistant in the environment. It does do, uh, so it's very infectious to uh, birds placed there. Uh, it's usually inhaled, and that's how we get the uh, main route of transmission. And in my opinion, most birds are infected within the first two weeks of life. So that's why we put in a virus vaccine right away, either in the embryonated egg before they hatch or right after hatch so that the vaccine has a chance to get into the system and hopefully block the wild type infectious viruses before they can get into the body and attach to their receptor sites and start the uh, inflammatory or cancer process. Merrick's disease can cause almost any uh, manifestation, any kind of clinical disease. It depends on so many factors, the virus strain, the bird genetics, the exposure rate, all kinds of environmental factors. For general information, I like to split the disease processes into two. One is the nervous and paralytic form that usually shows up from four to 12 months of age, and then the neoplastic or cancer form that usually shows up after one year of age. And they usually don't show up together. However, uh, I have seen the neurological form after a year of age. I've seen the cancer form before one year of age, and I've seen both together. So, that's just a general rule of thumb. If you have a bird that's six months old and and has shown neurological symptoms or can't walk or is lame, that's going to be Merix, and that's the neurological form. Usually the cancer form, I'm going to see it in birds two, three, four years of age. And it can be in any organ and any tissue, and that will determine what kind of clinical symptoms you have. 
Our diagnostic tools are necropsy with histopathology confirmation. We do not have an antemortem test for Marek's disease. Here's the classical form that was probably originally described and has been used for dozens of years in textbooks and teaching modules. A bird that is down cannot move, it's paralyzed, and one leg is back and the other leg is tucked up. That's the classical presentation. Or it could just be a bird that's lame. The other form, neurological, is if the bird is ataxic or acts like it's in a drunken stupor or can't stand upright, anything like that in a young bird, four to 12 months of age, the, the number one rule out is Merrick's disease. Uh, here's a case, if you remember that first that first picture where I showed the polycerositis, the, the liver did not fill up the whole salomic cavity. Well, here, that great big thing in the middle of this picture is a, a liver filled with Marek's disease tumors and inflammatory cells. The heart is on the right, you can see, so the liver is impinging on the presence of the heart, and that liver is just markedly enlarged. So this bird would have just been an eight doing right bird would had uh, problems with uh, hepatic function and who knows where else that tum those tumor cells were it probably wasn't just in the liver here's one where the liver is not as involved you can see some little white spots in it but the right to the left of the liver and above the gizzard is the spleen which is greatly enlarged and filled with tumor cells Marek's disease can go in the heart. You can have heart failure. You can go in the lungs. You can have respiratory disease. It can go in the kidneys, and you can have renal failure. It just depends. It does what it wants to do, and there's there's no treatment for these particular this particular disease. However, we can vaccinate, and you can get a hold of vaccine in your backyard. Uh, production facilities. Uh, what we usually do is vaccinate at one day of age. Uh, many of the big producers will vaccinate in OVO at 18 days of incubation, three days before hatch. Uh, and large scale producers almost vaccinate almost 100% of their stock, including short lived broiler birds that are only gonna be out there for a few weeks to a few months. And the long lived birds are all vaccinated for Marek's disease. You can buy the freeze-dried HVT vaccine, which is the serotype 3 vaccine, and you can vaccinate your birds subcutaneously. Uh, however, there's a couple of drawbacks. One, the vaccine only lasts about two to three hours after you reconstitute it. You need to keep it chilled because it's a live virus and it deteriorates very rapidly upon reconstitution. You also have to buy a 1,000 dose vial, which most people don't need that many. However, that's the smallest that they make, and they can't more. If they had to make a smaller batch, smaller dose numbers, like 50 or 10 or 20, the cost would go up. So it's cheaper to buy the 1,000 dose vial, which they make and have been making for decades. And you're just going to have to get rid of the vaccine that you do not use. It's about $25 now. It used to be about 15 a few years ago, but I think it's about $25 plus probably shipping to buy uh, one of these vials of vaccine. Uh, probably the third most common thing I get asked about is foul pox, which is a disease caused by foul pox virus. Many species of birds have their own specific types of pox virus. The transmission occurs by mechanical vectors, usually biting insects or mosquitoes or serve as the number one vector. Any kind of biting insect can serve as a vector or cuts and contaminated, uh, contaminated cuts with the virus can also uh, cause these lesions to come up. Uh, the virus can also reach the oral mucosa and down into the trachea, usually via the lacrimal duct if you have infection around the eye. Uh, 
The disease, it can be very mild to severe depending on the infection rate and where the infection occurs. If it's around the eyes and the nares, it can interfere with sight, it can interfere with respiration. If it gets into the mouth and down into the trachea, it can interfere with prehension of food, it can interfere with breathing. Uh, disease can occur at any age. It usually, it's when we have a mosquito storm following some kind of rain event where there's lots of mosquitoes and they pick up this virus from somewhere, bring it into your flock, and that's where most of these particular outbreaks occur. Our diagnostic tools are necropsy with histopath, or you can actually take a biopsy of these and send them in for histopathology. There are PCR, PCR tests available at other diagnostic labs, and again, you would have to take off uh, a piece, a biopsy, and send it in, and you can either do histopath with us, or you can do a PCR test for at other labs. Here's the most common classical presentation of dry pox, or the pox on the comb. And if this is all you've got is pox on the comb and nowhere else, uh, these lesions are not going to be the problem other than they don't look nice. They will eventually dry up and fall off. Uh, you can treat them with some kind of antibiotic ointment if you'd like to try and prevent secondary bacterial infection on the surface, but eventually these things will, the bird will get immune and these lesions will slough off. This is what we don't want to see is severe infestations or infections around the eye where that eye is completely obliterated and there's just a big area of Casey's actually where the eye used to be. It's also plugging up the nares, and obviously this bird was not going to survive. If you've got something that disfigures the edge of the eyelid or in the nares, you try to keep that nares open, and if the eye wants to close shut and get infected, you got to try and keep that eyelid open and clean, and that bird will eventually overcome the pox lesion on the eyelid but you don't want to sacrifice the eye in, in the meantime. So it's it's doing what you need to do to just keep that, that eye clean before, while that pox lesion uh, clears. Here's if you have it in the mouth. Uh, this is a turkey, but you can see these large plaques, and these are pox lesions. There's other things that could cause this to disease, but this is usually the most common. Uh, a differential would be trichomoniasis. If you've got a pigeon problem and you've got pigeons contaminating your environment, you might get lesions that look like this that might be trichomoniasis, but this is wet pox. And this is wet pox in the trachea. And you can see on the bottom picture, it's kind of red, but there's little areas of, of white, cream colored. Those are little proliferative lesions of the, of the pox virus. And you can see the one up above, right at the opening of the glottis, that whole lumen was completely filled with that proliferating lesion and that bird was, would uh, suffocate just from the inability to get air through the opening. There is no treatment um, other than maybe just treating the little lesions on the comb, but we can vaccinate and we can prevent or we can even vaccinate in the face of an outbreak. Uh, you can buy a foul pox virus vaccine and you use a wing web or a thigh stick. If you're doing turkeys, you might want to consider thigh stick because they stick their head under their wing when they sleep. And they, the, since this is a live virus vaccine that you're administering in the wing web, they could get transmission of that vaccine from the skin to their eye or their head. But what we do is you spread out the wing and you stab it and it should develop a small bump or scab, which is called a vaccine take in about a week at the site of where you vaccinate. And that tells you you've got to take. Vaccination is usually done four to six week old birds. It can be done earlier, but if you do it earlier, Oftentimes it could be done with uh, 
via the wing web or even subcutaneously. And a booster dose would be recommended at six weeks of age. Again, you can order a vaccine like this with an applicator that's a two-pronged applicator, and you reconstitute this vaccine. Again, it's a live vaccine. It lasts about two to three hours. It only comes in 1,000-dose vials. It's very similar to Merix in that way, but you just reconstitute it. You dip that applicator into the, into the solution, and there's enough slits in those those needles to carry enough vaccine, you just stab it through the wing, completely through the wing web and pull back and that delivers the vaccine into the skin where it can replicate and induce an immune response. Uh, a lot of times you can only go by this with an avian encephalomyelitis virus and that's just fine. It's not going to hurt anything. Uh, in fact, it would help prevent if you're going to have breeders and you got layers, you're going to want to raise some baby chicks, it would pass on the avian encephalomyelitis. It would prevent the breeders from getting avian encephalomyelitis virus and also pass along those antibodies to the babies. So uh, now I'm going to switch into parasites that are common and folks first on the intestinal tract. The most common one that many people have heard of is coccidiosis, and they are very familiar. If I see bloody diarrhea in my birds at three or four or five or six weeks of age, I've got coccidia and I need to treat. And that's a good rule of thumb because that's usually the case. It's not always the case, but it's usually the case. Uh, birds have their own species of coccidia. So chickens have their own, turkeys have their own, quail have their own. They don't cross infect. So you, so chicken coccidia do not infect turkeys or vice versa. Uh, it's a fecal oral transmission and life cycles four to six days. So it only takes a little less than a week for these things to replicate once. And once they replicate, they can exponentially explode into very high numbers. And so a couple of three cycles through a couple of three birds on the premise and your whole environment is contaminated with massive numbers of coccidia. Um, depression, ruffled feathers, droopy birds, mortality, weight loss are the common symptoms and the age helps you diagnose this as well and you can get secondary clostridium infections which cause necrotic enteritis which is even more lethal than the coccidia alone. Our diagnostic tools, the ones that I use, are necropsy. I can diagnose many of them just at necropsy, or we can do scrapings and look under wet mounts, or we can do histopathology on fixed tissues, or we can do fecal flotation of, of uh, feces. The three most common in backyard birds are going to be discussed here. Imeria cervulina is the one that usually infects the upper small intestine. It's the least lethal of the three. If, you, if you're familiar with looking at the intestinal tract of a bird, that is the duodenal loop surrounding the pancreas. This is the upper part of the intestine that comes out of the gizzard. And if you can see those white little splotches through the wall of that intestinal tract, those are sheets and sheets of, of coccidia infecting the epithelial cells. The only reason this one isn't more lethal is everything occurs in the epithelium that can regenerate after the, the epithelial cells are sloughed with those parasites, and it doesn't invade deeper into the body up to the wall of the, of the intestine like the other two that I'm going to talk about. This one is Imeria nicatrix. This one is a slower grower, it takes longer to develop, and it would usually show up not quite at three weeks, but more like six weeks of age. And it infects the mid part of the gut, not the duodenum that's coming right out of the gizzard. It doesn't do very well up there, but it's more in the mid intestine. And it has this dilated look, and we call it a salt and pepper look through the mucosal or cirrhosal wall here. 
And if you open that up, it can be bloody or it can be just dead tissue in there. And this is more invasive and it causes a lot of destruction of the wall. And it's very difficult for birds to recover from this once they get, if they get something this severe. Even if you get them treated and they survive, they're going to have trouble the rest of their life because part of their gut lining wall is going to be ineffective at doing its function. And this can be showing up as bloody. But the one that usually shows up as bloody is Imeria tenella. And this is the one that infects the distal part of the intestinal tract in the cecal pouches. Again, if you've looked at the intestinal tract, it goes down and then there's these two blind pouches that you can see that come off the distal small intestine. And this just shows that on the one on the left, you can see those two red, dark red pouches of, of the cecum. They should be cream colored or that light orangish yellowish color of the other intestines. And those are just filled with, with hemorrhage. And on the right, you can see where uh, it's been taken out of the body and one of them's opened up and it's just frank blood in there. And these birds bleed out and they just die of anemia and severe toxemia. Fortunately, we can treat uh, amprolium. Uh, comes in various forms, amprolium P, amprol, corid. It's a 9.6% 9, 9 oral solution, and there should be instructions on the, on the package of how to treat. Usually in severe outbreaks, we go 16 ounces per 50 gallons for three to five days and then drop it down to a low dose of four ounces per 50 gallons for another one to two weeks. Or you can start at a mid-level if you don't have a severe uh, outbreak. But you're going to have to treat for a while until these birds uh, get over it. They will become immune to the coccidia after a while, but that takes a while and you got to balance the treatment to keep the, the numbers low enough to where they can be immunized, but they don't die of, of disease. Fortunately, with amprolium, there's no withdrawal period. Unfortunately, I, I guess I should say that some, particularly Imeria tenella, the, the one in the distal part of the gut, occasionally we find resistant strains, and you may have to go to an off-label prep uh, to, uh, to treat them, but usually amprolium will work, and that's, that's your first go-to to see if you can't get it treated. And it's it's still been readily available because we use co-read in all kinds of species, not just chickens. Sulfadimethoxine or albon can be used as well. And for chickens, it's a fluid ounce per two gallons. And turkeys, it's a fluid ounce and for four gallons. That's because turkeys just drink more than the chickens, so they don't need as much. They'll dose themselves at a higher rate. You treat for five consecutive days, and then it has a five-day withdrawal. Uh, this works. This works as well, and can be tried as the initial treatment. Um, and it's been around for a long time, and it does work. You can get coccidiosis treatment and feed. You can buy treated feed that has amprolium in it. The, the big producers uh, often, they use amprolium in some instances, but they also have other ionophores and chemicals that they use because in these big poultry houses, coccidia is there and they have to deal with it every flock. And so they have to prevent it or treat it in every single flock that's out there. And so they have various chemicals or ionophores in the feed to uh, control the coccidia at an acceptable level. And like I said, you can have some medicated feeds do have amprolium at the, the feed store. Now switch over to the parasites. There's four parasites uh, that are common classes. There's the roundworms, the tapeworms, the threadworms, and the cecal worms. The roundworms, threadworms, and cecal worms are all nematodes and they all would be treated with the same kind of compounds, tapeworms. If you have tapeworms, which aren't near as common, but can be a problem, you have to treat with a different drug, which is not approved uh, 
in backyard poultry or in poultry in general. And usually with parasites, it's weight loss, diarrhea, diarrhea, visible worms. I've seen some cases, particularly with thread worms, where the birds actually just starved to death because the infection was so bad. And one of the common complaints is the birds are eating normally, but they're losing weight and uh, or they're not gaining weight. Roundworms are not particularly devastating unless you get a severe infection like this where it actually will block the intestine. And this is just a severe case of roundworms. And as you can see, most of my pictures have been the courtesy of Dr. John Barnes, recently retired from the College of Veterinary Medicine in North Carolina State University. But uh, this was one that he had that I don't know where he got it, but that that's just horrible. That's just way too many. This is tapeworms, and this one you can see, particularly down in the lower left-hand corner, where these things are segmented, and that's the definition of a tapeworm. They have these little proglottids that are each one of those segments is called a proglottid, and they have everything to, instead of laying eggs like the nematodes do, they shed those proglottids, and they're infective. The cases that I've seen that have been devastating with tapeworms are microscopic and you can't see them grossly. You can only see them on scrapings uh, of the intestine and they can cause uh, severe weight loss and mortality. I don't have a good case of thread worms to show you. So I got this picture off the TVMDL website. These things are so thin, I have to see them under the microscope but they're very, very tiny, very, very thin. They also can be devastating in the upper small intestine if the numbers are too high because they prevent digestion and absorption just like those uh, tapeworms do. And I've seen birds die of threadworm uh, infection. And the last one is cecal worms. This is those cecal pouches that I talked about earlier. You see here, this is the bl blind end of a, of a cecal pouch, and you can see the worms on the left through the wall of the cecum, little squiggly things there, and then on the right, it's opened up, and those are the contents, and you can see the worms in there. The round worms and the thread, the round worms and the cecal worms are not particularly devastating unless they're in very, very, very high numbers. Uh, compared to the thread worms and the tapeworms. Treatment, this is the old time treatment that I don't recommend, but I just included it because I think, I'm not sure you can still buy it, but maybe you can if you can find it. It's only has a claim for adult ascarids. And so it doesn't get the juveniles, it doesn't get the baby brown worms, it doesn't get anything else. And I don't ever recommend it. The one that we do have, that is, uh, it's expensive, and that's the problem with it, for, particularly for backyard people, is it's fenbendazole and it's Safeguard Aquasol. And this is, uh, it was licensed to go to the big producers, so they sell it in one liter and one gallon sizes, which then need to be diluted quite a bit. So it's relatively expensive, but there's no withdrawal period. Uh, it's approved for birds or meat birds and for birds in lay. So there's no withdrawal period. And so that's the big problem with fembendazole and other preparations is it doesn't stay uh, in suspension in water. This one does. And that's what they worked so hard to do to get the claim is that this Safeguard Aquasol, this fenbendazole treatment stays in suspension. Where others that I'm going to mention here in a minute do not stay in suspension in water. So the birds would not be getting an adequate dose by drinking the water. Worming treatments. Here's, here's one for non-producing birds. And this is fenbendazole, which... There's a couple of brand names there, Safeguard and Panicure. These are common uh, 
wormers that are usually for goats or sheep. And it will treat the thread worms, the round worms, and the sequel worms. But it's exact same compound as in the Safeguard Aquasol, but there is no bird claim for this because the manufacturer did not go after a claim for this because it's not used enough to uh, get a claim so that they can uh, sell it. So if it's not going to make them money, they're not going to go after the claim. So, But the, the drug is the exact same drug as in Safeguard Aquasol. And this is, uh, you can take an ounce of this and mix it in a cup of water and then put that in 15 to 20 pounds of feed and then feed that for three days. And I put this in non-producing birds because it's not uh, approved to be used in poultry. But if you're, if you're just trying to worm your birds and you need them wormed and you're not, your birds are not in production, they're not for meat, and they're not for eggs, uh, that's what you can use. It's the same drug. Another one that's not approved, but it's commonly used in other meat animals, it's ivermectin. Uh, and then there's all the other drugs that are very similar. But if you take ivermectin, you can either use the injectable or the boron, and you can administer it either orally, if it's the injectable, or topically, if it's the uh, boron. And so it's just like a spot on, or you can just put, shoot a little bit in its mouth. If you just have a few birds or spot on the back of the bird between the, uh, between the wings on the skin. And you can treat uh, these internal parasites. They also work on external parasites as well. So, and then... The second generation of prenomectin is, is ivermectin plus, really, and it's got the exact same dosages and the exact same uh, potential claims. Now, I'm going to jump into external parasites, which I think is the last part of this particular presentation. And the common external parasites that I have seen here are fleas, lice, and mites. And symptoms can include weight loss. You can actually see the parasites, nervousness, scratching. Uh, birds just, just don't feel good. And severe infestations can cause mortality. And this was a case where that was true. This was the first case I've ever seen, I ever saw of stick tight fleas. And this particular chicken, if you see along the top of its comb, it's kind of shriveled. And there's all kinds of black dots on the surface of the comb, below the eye, in front of the eye, down on the wattles. Those are all fleas that are stuck. They, they bite and they latch on and they hold on. And the gentleman that brought these birds to me couldn't see that he had poor eyesight and he could not see these stick tight fleas. And I took one of them off, took a picture of it under the microscope, and you can tell that that's the typical presentation of a flea. These birds also had lice, and these are, are uh, biting lice that are on the surface, and they had kind of a wet uh, presentation to the skin under the feathers. And you can see when you parted the feathers, these lice would just scurry along. And this is a picture of one of the lice or the louse that I pulled off of that particular bird and took a picture of it as well. And then finally, the third one is mites. And the most common mites that you're going to see are the ones around the, the vent. And they look like uh, it can get moist and damp. And when you look and try to part the feathers, you might see what looks like little specks of pepper scooting across the surface of the skin is what it would look like. And you have to, to uh, get them under the microscope usually to see that they're little mites. And I don't have a microscopic picture of mites, unfortunately. There's one other, there's one other mite that I've had a number of calls on lately. It's when 
you have birds and they're losing their feathers. They're they're normal and they're doing okay, but they're losing their feathers right above the tail head and they get a big bald spot. And it might be kind of irritated and they might be plucking out feathers, but it's just a big bald spot. And that's a that's a depluming mite. It's a nematocoptes mite that uh, you really need to treat both probably topically and systemically with uh, something like an ivermectin to try and get those birds because they burrow, burrow into the hair shafts. I Fortunately, I didn't have a pre- picture of that, but it just came to mind because I've had a couple of three calls just lately about it. Treatment. Uh, sulfur dust. You can, uh, you can buy dust bags of sulfur uh, and just split them open and put them and let the birds... Uh, dust themselves with the sulfur dust that's very toxic to these mites, particularly the, the, the mites, not so much the, not so much the fleas or the uh, lice, but the mites. And I know that I've got uh, organic producers, if they have an uh, outbreak of, of mites, that, that's what they'll do is they'll just put sulfur or put sulfur in the, in the litter or just put these bags and let the birds medicate themselves. Uh, other things you can do is you can buy organophosphates or permethrin and some products there that I've listed that I got from a gentleman that does this for a living. Uh, Raybon Wattable Powder, Rayvap, or Permethrin 10 Guard, and the dosages are there on the on the slide and how much it would treat. And you can uh, mix these up and spray the birds directly and the premises. And oftentimes this is very, very helpful. Um, you can have applications where you can spray, uh, like I said, directly on the feathers because you want to penetrate the feathers to get down to the lice and the mites. And uh, it may not work so well for the fleas, but uh, it would help in the environment for the fleas. So you might have to do some additional work other than just the external parasite treatment that's that's listed here. And then finally, I've just got some treatments and preventatives of interest. Apple cider vinegar, uh, I know a lot of people have used it. it, It has a lot of claims, uh, whether or not they're true or not. It's got a very acidic pH. It's got about the same pH as the true stomach of the chicken, the proventriculus. It could help with digestion. I think the main benefit is it helps keep down bacterial load and contamination load in the water. And it also uh, might help keep the bacterial load down in the mouth and the crop. It's also got some uh, nutritional value. So as far as efficacy, I just say questionable, but... uh, if you see an improvement and birds like to drink it and they seem to do better, I don't quibble about efficacy. It's doing something. I just don't know what for sure, but it, it's never, it's not going to hurt. Garlic. Uh, I know it's been used a lot in the organic industry and they have some compounds in garlic that have anaprotozole activity or antibacterial activity, and I listed the compounds there. Efficacy is probably likely. I don't know how much. I I don't know much about these other than people use them, and if you might want to look into them, if you don't want to use antibiotics or other chemicals, it's something you could look into as a possibility to help with your uh, treatment of disease. And then the last slide, uh, treatments, preventatives of interest of diatomaceous earth. And this is, uh, these are just fossilized remains of marine phytoplankton. So I've heard the saying, you put this in the letter and the worms will die a death by a thousand cuts, or if if they eat it and it goes into their intestinal tract, the same thing would happen that the worms would die of a thousand cuts from these sharp things. I don't know 
how well it's how well it works. I'm not an expert on it. I just know it's out there. It's something you might want to look into if you want to use that type of uh, non-traditional therapy as the poultry industry goes by. So it's just out there and something that you might want to use. I just don't know about if it's, its efficacy, so I just list it as questionable. And finally, my contact information is here on the last uh, slide. I work at the Gonzales uh, Texas Veterinary Medical Diagnostic Lab location in Gonzales, Texas. Uh, my work number and fax number are there, also my email. Many people will call me with questions and be glad to discuss any, or you can send me emails with pictures to help diagnose something and all that telemedicine is something that I do just for free. If uh, if we if we can do it over the phone or if we can do it over the uh, email, that's fine with me. So with that, that's the conclusion of my presentation. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, my name is Mindy Borst and thank you for joining me today as I talk about poultry parasites. Recognizing signs of parasitic infections early is key to maintaining a healthy flock as well as having a successful 4-H project. So today we're gonna discuss four main types of internal parasites. So those are gonna be parasites within the gastrointestinal tract, so within your intestines, and three types of common external parasites, so ones that you should be able to visually see outside of the body. We're going to talk about signs your birds can show um, when they have either internal or external or both types of parasites so that you can be on the lookout, especially if you're purchasing a new bird or introducing a new bird to an already established flock. We're going to start with the four most common types of internal parasites. The four types of parasites we're going to talk about today are going to fall under two major classifications, worms and protozoa. Worms are a little bit easier for us to understand because they are part of the animal kingdom like you and I are, meaning that they're multicellular organisms that we can see with the naked eye, and they have males and females, or they're hermaphroditic. Protozoa are a little bit more interesting um, because they're not animals, they're actually protists, and they are unicellular, meaning they're a single cellular organism. They are microscopic, so you cannot see them with, without some sort of aid, and uh, they were reproduced by binary fission meaning that they take that single cell that they are and it divides into two equal portions. The first three intestinal parasites we're going to talk about are going to be worms, with the first one being our large roundworms because they are the most common intestinal parasites found in poultry, especially our chicken and turkeys. Now low numbers are technically considered normal, but it's our high numbers that are gonna cause significant damage and are most commonly going to be seen in poorly maintained backyard flocks and poorly maintained houses and pens. It's important to know, especially with parasitic infections, it's gonna lower your animal's immune systems and they're gonna be more susceptible to more viruses and bacterial infections, which is, could eventually lead to death because of these multi-infection cases. These worms, I typically tell people, look like spaghetti because they are that big. And as you can imagine, having these giant worms in your intestinal tract, is going to cause some significant damage. In high infections, you can actually see your birds defecate these worms out. And, and very interestingly, in very bad infections, the worms are trying to find a different place to live because they run out of room, and you can actually find them in chicken eggs. In very uh, bad cases, that will obviously lead to death because you will end up with a rupture of your intestines. As you can see here, this is an piece of intestines that the worms have actually they just ran out of space and it actually ruptured the intestinal tract. So we want you to avoid this as much as possible. And if you're curious, the, it is very easy to transmit these parasites because they are transmitted from bird to bird through feces. The second internal parasite we're going to talk about are going to be our cecal worms. Our cecal worms are, as the name implies, they live in the cecum. The cecum is a blind pouch within the intestinal tract. So your roundworms are going to live within the small and large intestines, but your cecal worms are going to live in this little blind pouch. You see this little pouch here. So as you can imagine, these worms are actually going to be much smaller because they're gonna reside in a much smaller area. So these worms are typically referred to as pinworms because they are so much tinier than our large roundworms. These worms were actually are going to require 
earthworms as part of the life cycle. So our large roundworms you get just from being near other animal species, but these ones you're actually going to require an earthworm to be in contact with the animal species, then the earthworms get the parasite, and then now the bird has to eat the earthworm. So interestingly, this is actually a very common parasite, and the parasite itself actually causes little to no damage, especially in our chickens. So this worm is actually not a really a bad thing. It's common, and it doesn't cause any damage. What's the problem with this worm is that it actually has its own parasite that is a protozoa, so our single cellular parasite. And this actually causes a deadly disease in our turkeys specifically called blackhead disease. So the problem is, is that sequel worms are very common in our chickens, but we don't want any sequel worms in our turkeys. So it's very common that people say, do not house your turkeys and chickens together, because if your chickens have sequel worms, that's okay. But if they carry that protozoa, those sequel worms have the protozoa, your chickens will be fine, but all your turkeys are going to die. So a lot of times, if you ever hear people say, don't house your turkeys and chickens together, that's why. The last worm we're going to talk about are tapeworms. And tapeworms, as the name implies, are very flat and long. So if you think of your large roundworms like spaghetti, I would call tapeworms your fettuccine noodles. So the problem with tapeworms is there are about 1,400 species of tapeworm that exist in poultry and wild birds. But thankfully, most of them are actually considered harmless. And if your birds get them, you're not really going to notice. The problem is, is that there are two species that will actually call, cause bleeding of the intestines and that will eventually lead to death. So the good thing is, is that it does require uh, something called an intermediate host. So like our sequel worms required an earthworm in order to continue the life cycle. These are going to require an arthropod. So like ants, beetles, houseflies. So they're a lot more common in our free range animals that are out there eating whatever they find versus those kept in houses and pens. Here you can see a representation of our three most common species. So here we have our round worms that are gonna be our spaghetti. We have here in the middle our cecal worms that are our small pin worms that live in the cecum, and then our very large tapeworms that are flat and long. Here are some things that you can watch for that should raise concern for intestinal worms. The first one is drooping of the wings or head. Another one is they don't want to eat and they look really thin and unhealthy. Um, they're not moving out and up, up and about as much. And honestly, they just don't have good performance. They're not gaining weight. They're not growing and they're not producing eggs the way they should. So this is a great visual representation of two birds that are the exact same age, but the top one has an intestinal worm infection. The last intestinal parasite we're going to talk about today are going to be our protozoa. Our protozo protozoa are going to be our weird ones because they are not animals. They are single cell organisms that are going to require a host to survive in. So what they're going to survive in are actually going to be the individual cells of the lining of the intestines. So this is just a really quick representation of the intestinal lining. And these are going to be the cells that are going to be absorbing all your nutrients, all the water and all the food the animal and you are eating. And what's going to happen is, is that these coccidia are actually going to penetrate through these cells. And as they reproduce, they're going to rupture that cell open. So what's going to happen is it's going to cause lots of tissue damage and it's going to cause bleeding. And then the animal's not going to be able to absorb any nutrients because the lining of its intestinal tract is going to be completely destroyed. So our young birds are going to be the most susceptible and the one that's going to damage the most because they're not going to be getting nutrients they need to grow and survive. The problem with coccidia is that it's super easy to uh, transmit once an animal has it because it's going to cling on to clothing, footwear, equipment, and it's even been shown to spread um, via the wind on dust and litter over very short distances. So if hen houses are very close to each other and one has a coccidia outbreak that's very bad, all it takes is a big gust of wind to move that litter over to another one and now your other uh, house now has coccidia as well. Some signs to watch for for a coccidia infection would be bloody diarrhea from the bleeding of those cells as they rupture. Uh, watery diarrhea because as the animal's drinking, they can't absorb any of the nutrients or any of the water they need to, so it just comes out. And then obviously weight loss because they're not getting any of their nutrients and they're just so tired and they look very ruffled. 
So here are some chicks, and yeah, as you can see, there's, they're also showing some other clinical signs. So they've got very pale combs, they've got a huddled stance, and there are some bloody droppings in the background. So ultimately, we need to know how to prevent internal parasites. The first one is to keep coops dry. Parasites need a wet environment to survive. And the next one is to keep your coops clean. The only way for parasites to continue their life cycle is through the feces. So if you're removing the feces, there's no way for these parasites to continue their life cycle. Another one is to quarantine any new birds because you have no idea what parasites new birds have. And if you have a healthy flock, it takes one new bird with a parasite to now have all of your birds to now have parasites. Same with wild birds. Wild birds can transmit parasites to your domesticated birds. So make sure you keep them away as much as possible so they cannot defecate near your domestic birds. Now we're going to briefly talk about the three common external parasites. So the three external parasites we're going to talk about are going to be our lice, fleas, and mites. Now don't let this chart intimidate you. It's just showing you the differences and the similarities between the three. What I really want you to focus on here is the size difference. So we're going to talk about them in difference uh, from largest to smallest. And what I tried to do here was draw eight millimeters. Now, if you have a blown up screen, please keep that in mind because it's gonna make it larger. But you can see lice are uh, of eight millimeters are the largest. Two millimeters are gonna be our fleas and one millimeter are gonna be our mites. So we're gonna start talking about our lice first. There are lots of different species of lice and we are not gonna talk about all of them. What's important is that you can actually identify what a louse looks like. So lice, again, are going to be about eight millimeters in size. So they're going to be a little bit easier for you to visualize and see. Uh, lice are pretty much going to live anywhere on your bird. They can be on the body, in the, you know, on your legs, on the face, in the feathers. And basically what these lice do is they actually eat debris. So they eat skin, they eat feathers. So they're going to cause lots of itching and uncomfortableness and feather loss and, and skin damage. Here you can see a wing louse species, um, what almost just looks like debris, but you can see that it's here. And what's gonna end up eventually happening is that these lice will actually cause holes in these feathers, which is not gonna look good if you were trying to show these animals. Our next external parasite are fleas. There is a single flea species of concern in poultry, and it's very unlike our dog and cat fleas, which jump and move around and kind of glide through the fur. As the name implies, a stick type flea is actually going to embed itself into the tissue and not move, much like a tick would. So these fleas actually have a mouth part that they'll actually push through the skin and stay in a single spot. So you can actually visualize these fleas because they're not hopping around. Unlike our lice that we talked about, these fleas are actually going to be drinking blood. So very high infections can cause a lot of blood loss, which is going to be, make very tired animals. And lastly, we'll talk about our smallest external parasites, the mites. There are a lot of different mite species and each species kind of specializes in a different part of the body. Most of our mites are going to be within the feathers, but there are a couple of mite species that will actually embed in the skin of like the legs. The problem with mites is they are really small, so sometimes it's really hard to visualize them. And all it will look like is that there is junk everywhere, which this junk is actually a bunch of debris from the, from the mites, their feces, and their eggs and everything. So because basically they're making this area their home. So this is basically their dump. The problem is that you can't really see these guys are super small. Sometimes they just look like they're moving granules of dirt. So here's some other pictures. This on the top image you see here is a clean bird that is not infected. And here on the bottom, you see a bird that is infected with a very high population of mites. So you can see again, it's hard to visualize the mites themselves, but you can see the damage that they're leaving behind. You can see all the eggs, their feces, and all the debris they're leaving behind on these birds. These are just additional pictures of another mite species that's pretty common, and their name red poultry mite comes from the fact that they actually will ingest blood, and so the mites actually look red. So here's a kind of a blown up picture of these mites, because again, they're very small, so this is a blown up picture. Um, so here's what the red mites actually look like on the, on the skin, so you can kind of visualize them a little better because of their, their redness. So you can see this infection isn't quite, this infestation is not quite as bad, um, but you do, you do see some debris here on these feathers.
these mites also have a tendency to cluster along surfaces so that they can hitch a ride as other birds come by. The last mite I wanted to talk about was the scaly lead mite because it is a little bit unique in that it's going to live under the skin instead of within the feathers. The reason why is because these mites actually have very tiny legs, so they cannot move, maneuver between the feathers. So they're actually going to live underneath the scales of the leg. And they get their name from the fact they're going to cause a lot of damage within the skin and the scales of the legs. So their, their skin's going to get very dry and very scaly. And sometimes it can cause deformities and infections um, of the legs. Signs to watch for for external parasites are much easier to visualize because it's happening outside the body versus internal parasites where it's happening inside the body. So you expect to see feather loss with things that are living on the feather and causing damage to the feathers. You're going to see lots of scratching, redness and scabbing, matted feathers, and then holes in the feathers for those species of mites and lice that are going to live on the feathers themselves. You're going to see your birds clean themselves a lot as they try to clean off all the debris and the actual parasites themselves. You're going to see limping with the damaged legs of the scaly leg mite and then decreased egg production from just animals that are just very stressed out. So here are some ways to prevent and control external parasites. Firstly, you should always examine new birds. Pull apart their feathers, look at their skin, make sure there's no debris along the shaft of the feather, look at their legs, and then just uh, take a look at their face and make sure you don't see any fleas. Secondly, you should definitely clean equipment between your birds, between your, your, ha your hen houses. Um, it's very easy to transfer any external parasites from one flock to another if you're not cleaning it off because they will hitch rides on your clothing and on your shoes and any equipment that you're using between. Uh, consider adding diatomaceous earth to dust baths. Diatomaceous earth is really just, it's, it's a fancy way of saying it's a powder, but the powder uh, granules are actually very pointy and these points will actually penetrate through the, ex, uh, the exoskeleton of these um, lice and mites and will actually cause them to die, which is actually a very easy way to treat for external parasites. Um, there's actually been studies as well that have shown that if you don't trim the beaks of birds, they actually do a much better job of preening um, and getting rid of their own external parasites through grooming than if you trim their beaks and that allows them not to groom in case they do pick up parasites. And lastly, try to keep wild birds away from your flock as much as possible because a lot of these species can be transmitted from any birds that are traveling through the area. Thank you all for joining me and listening to this poultry presentation. I hope you all have a better understanding of the common parasites seen in domestic birds, and I hope you can better screen new birds when purchasing them, and I hope you can better maintain your current flock.